Hey, everybody. So this is something that I just started playing around with uh, after I read the FNET paper. Uh, and then also, too, there's been a viewer of mine that has been um, messaging me with some very interesting notebooks regarding like Fibonacci sequences, uh, dimensionality, uh, and things like that. And um, so based off of like kind of what I've been communicating with them and what I uh, saw from the FNet paper, I decided to do a bit more research. Um, and then so I created this concept, I'm calling it Fibonacci energy. And Fibonacci energy is an open source exploration into the intersection of resonant energy, transfer, feedback loops, and structured oscillations inspired by the Fibonacci sequence. Through simulated experiments, we have modeled a system that appears to cycle and reinforce energy in a structured way similar to a thermodynamic engine, but operating on differential energy gradients rather than temperature differences. Um, this is 100% all through simulation. I haven't, I, I don't have a way to um, test this physically. I don't know if it would work physically. Uh, it works in simulation. Uh, and then so it's uh, exactly what uh, I have outlined here, like a new type of engine. Right? It's very specifically like uh, what it would be. Uh, and then so the goal of this project is to open source the findings and simulations so that the broader scientific and engineering communities can validate or refute the principles through real world experimentation, extend their research by testing the system in new conditions and like real world conditions and explore the potential applications, including energy harvesting, resonance based systems and structured energy transform uh, transfer mechanisms. So key findings that I found so far from these experiments. One, structured energy cycling. The system does not dissipate energy randomly, but instead appears to organize it into a stable oscillations. Uh, my engine creates stability. Two, entropy reduction instead of increase. Unlike a standard therm thermodynamic system, entropy decreases over time, suggesting a self-reinforcing structure. Three, effective temperature concept. Energy fluctuation over time behave like an effective temperature, similar to how heat engines operate across the thermal gradients. Four, potential for energy extraction. The system allows for controlled energy reinforcement and extraction without apparent collapse. Current limitations. This is all simulation based, right? So no, I don't have any real world physical validation yet. These models may not hold up in practice for all I know. <laughs> There's no verified energy source within this. So the energy may be structured mathematically, but it might not correspond to a physical extraction mechanism. <laughs> so that's very important to get into uh, at this point, what we're actually looking at here, right? So uh, essentially I go through and, and I'll sh show you this collab notebook. Um, and then, so this note notebook explores uh, high dimensional waveform representations, anomaly detection, and energy dynamics using concepts from HDC, the Hilbert transform, and Fibonacci-based structures. The goal is to investigate how waveforms evolve in high-dimensional spaces, identify anomalous resonances, and model energy transfer mechanisms that could hint at deeper structural insights into wave interactions. And then I do a bunch of experiments here, which ends with our model that we're going to talk about here, right? But so through these experiments, kind of what I start getting at and start um, Pinpointing is, and my assumption is, is that when we look at waveforms like Fourier waves, etc., I think that there's um, like a extra layer there, right? That there's more um, to the wave than we're detecting. That uh, let's say that um, we detect the wave in like two dimensions or three dimensions. That like the wave could exist in four, five, ten dimensions, right? And then so uh, I want to initially test that, right? And then so I initially just test this by looking for anomalous frequencies where essentially I find like uh, frequencies that um, have more energy than they should, right? And then I find uh, some anomalous frequencies, so 2.6, 4.1, 4.8, 8.9, and 9.5. Uh, and then I run through and then I do, um, the next experiment that I do is uh, I do like uh, phase shifts on, on these anomalous frequencies. And then I try to see if I can find essentially like um, if they follow a, a, like a standard waveform pattern and, and what these phase shifts look like. Uh, and it's kind of interesting how it graphs out with, within this um, and within these uh, frequencies and these phase shifts specifically, we do see that there's... Uh, some very clear anomalies uh, within these specific frequencies and around these frequency ranges, around these ranges, right? So 2.6, 4.1, 4.8, 8.9, and 9.5. 
Uh, and then I essentially, I do more tests to, to validate this, right? Um, so I can see here, like, there's a, like, uh, something happens <laughs> within this range. Uh, and then specifically, um, I, I introduce uh, time steps into this frequency as well. So, like, at the time steps where these same frequencies occur, there's also anomalies. So at like time step 2.6, 4.1, 4.8, 8.9, 9.5, uh, I get phase shift anomalies that occur out of the data from that as well. Uh, and then so that's significant and intriguing to me. Um, and then so I start diving into this uh, further. Uh, and then um, so the next thing I do is again, like uh, I've been, in, it, someone has been um, message me very specifically, and I don't want to showcase their work without um, their permission, but and, and talk about their work without their permission at all, but uh, they're huge into uh, Fibonacci sequences, and they've been taking a lot of my work that I've been doing on dimensionality and uh, combining that with their Fibonacci work, and uh, I essentially just combined that and uh, laid that here, um, and then what I can see is that um, there's, uh, so I'm enforcing this pattern, right? I'm, uh, I'm laying the Fibonacci sequence directly onto these wave anomalies, but, uh, there's a pattern that emerges from it <laughs> and something comes out of it. Right. So, uh, I'm forcing this pattern again. I like, I'm putting, I'm literally overlaying the Fibonacci sequence on top of this, this, but this is the pattern that comes out. Um, so there's a pattern that, uh, we can get from this. Uh, and then, so essentially what I'm, uh, kind of stimulating and, and getting to at this point in my uh, assumptions are that essentially my assumption, uh, initial assumption is correct, that there's, uh, the wave function and that there's, um, extra dimensionalities to the wave function and that there's like, uh, energy in these extra dimensionalities and, and, and uh, that we can essentially, if we, broadened our lens essentially that we could access more of the wave function is like my hypothesis within this right i look at it like um look at like the color spectrum the light spectrum etc right like we know that there's colors that exist that you can't see there's light that exists that you can't see etc uh, and then so the same thing would be true for resonant frequencies in my opinion and, and waveforms right that there's um portions of the waveform and these resonant frequencies that um, exist that we just we can't see or like directly detect. Um, but I can detect that they're there via these types of experiments, right? <laughs> and uh, what I so then my hypothesis is then that essentially uh, these extra dimensionalities to like a resonant waveform would have uh, energy within them as well, right? So then I could essentially like borrow energy from these extra dimensions if I could access them. Uh, and then that's essentially uh, what I do within these next experiments here is I, I, I build out essentially a model off of this, right? So I simulate HDC parameters. I, I simulate the waveform very specifically in HDC space. So that's what I'm doing within this, right? I'm, I'm uh, creating a waveform and a wave function, and then I'm creating the wave function as a hyper vector, uh, and then like as a thousand dimensional vector. <laughs> and then uh, when I... Uh, uh, when I essentially like lay it out, I, I, the waveform shows like extra dimensionality within this and I can I utilize Hilbert transform. Uh, I, then I essentially reshape the, the waveform, right? So I, I do high dimensional encodings and then that's where I detect anomalies. And then I extract and ex extract and analyze those anomalies, compute the phase shifts, uh, for the anomalous waveforms. Uh, and then I'm just essentially like, plotting and graphing everything that's detected there, right? Um, and then uh, that's all I'm doing within this. Uh, and then generating the waveforms, measuring the waveforms, tracking the waveforms. <laughs> that's all this code is doing, right? Uh, and then when we go through, we can see we have our detected waveform. We see our non anomalous frequencies. We can clearly detect them and overlay them here. Uh, we can see, again, we have our phase shifts that definitively occur at our anomalous frequencies. Uh, our energy distribution across our anomalous frequencies. The phase shifts occurring again, and we can see like kind of the break in the phase shifts that occur, uh, especially here, right? This discon discontinuities. So there's something that, that clearly goes on there. We can see that there's also energy spikes at these discontinuities. So I can essentially try to pool this energy. That's what I want to do, right? Uh, and then so uh, when I match it up here against the Fibonacci wave sequence, it's again, we're, we're getting really clear uh, match and correlation between uh, the, essentially the golden ratio uh, and these energy spikes. So there's something that I can find and detect within there. Uh, and then within these last two experiments, I do like I simulate the energy transfer between dimensions, right? So then, okay, so all of this is true. Uh, and then if um, 
across this thousand dimensional hypervector that I create if the wave function collapses and then it creates, uh, let's say energy exists at like dimension 998, which would like never be detected, right? Uh, let me just borrow some, like, let me take that energy from uh, dimension 998 and put it into our dimension. <laughs> and uh, within that, uh, I'm able to do that. And, uh, it works within this instance. <clears throat> within this simulation, right? Um, and then so very specifically, the, the last uh, kind of simulation that I'll show you that occurs within this is these energy reservoirs, right? Um, and then so I create this system energy over time, and then I start extracting the energy, but I'm extracting the energy from like the hidden dimensions, from the dimensions that I can't see, right? Uh, and then when I do this, uh, essentially what comes out is I, uh, these are arbitrary numbers. So I set my uh, reservoir initial energy to 5,000, I'm ex extracting, 10% of the energy over 1,000 steps from these dimensions that I can't see. Uh, and then uh, every single step, it's extracting 10% of that energy. Uh, and then for 1,000 steps, and then after all of that extraction, we go from 5,000 down to 4,954. So I'm essentially extracting energy in this simulation out of thin air. But again, it's not out of thin air. And if I were extracting it out of thin air, that would 100% violate the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, and then within the system, this is very clearly within and, and following the laws of the second law of thermodynamics because I'm um, this one, this isn't a closed system. And then two, I'm not creating energy from nothing. I'm creating, I'm literally just borrowing energy from dimensions that in this instance, I can't directly compute, but I can detect that are there. And then so uh, if I can detect that they're there, I can detect a way to extract the energy uh, sources from that dimension and then just bring it into a different dimension. Uh, and as you can see here, that's clearly what happens. And, and what I do here, and then the final output is essentially I, like, I build an engine off of this, right? And then so your typical engine operates off of thermodynamics uh, and temperature, right? Uh, and then so it, it utilizes uh, temperature fluctuations and, and increases to, to make an engine go. That's how your typical like engine works, right? Your combustion engine works. Uh, and then so this method, what we're looking at and everything that I've outlined here uh, and expressed, this all operates like a combustion engine. <laughs> and then so that's what I want to uh, prove out here with this last step in these last cells is I like I've built out uh, effectively a combustion engine that operates off of these wave functions and these wave sequences uh, and it's working here in simulation. So up front, again, I'll, I'll end this video here. This is all in simulation, right? How exactly does this translate into the real world? I don't know. I don't know how you would access uh, these dimensions that I can't actually physically measure. Right? I can detect them in simulations. How exactly would you um, build a pump to these dimensions that impossible to measure uh, in physical systems, I don't know because they're impossible to measure, right? So um, there you go, it works in simulation. So in simulated uh, space, you can have uh, unlimited energy that doesn't violate the laws of second of thermodynamics and almost unlimited energy, right? You can, there's, this isn't unlimited because our reservoir is depleting, right? If it were unlimited, our reservoir would be 5,000 at the end, but reservoir is 4,954. Uh, after we've extracted like a thousand percent of the energy from it. So it's not, it's not infinite, but um, it's a very big well. Uh, and so if you like this type of content, please like and subscribe. Thank you very much.